Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses the section of the book titled Eigenspaces and Diagonal Matrices. A diagonal matrix is a square matrix that is zero everywhere except possibly along the diagonal. For example, the matrix shown here is a diagonal matrix. Clearly, every diagonal matrix is also an upper triangular matrix, but the converse is not true. An upper triangular matrix is not necessarily a diagonal matrix. We know that if an operator has an upper triangular matrix with respect to some basis, then the eigenvalues of that matrix are precisely the diagonal entries of that matrix. Hence, the same thing is true for diagonal matrices. For example, if an operator has the matrix shown in the left column, then the eigenvalues of that operator are precisely 8 and 5. Suppose t is an operator on v and lambda is a number. The eigenspace of t corresponding to lambda, denoted e of lambda comma t, is defined to equal the null space of t minus lambda times the identity. For a vector v to be in the null space of t minus lambda times the identity, we must have t minus lambda i applied to v equaling 0, which is equivalent to the equation t of v equals lambda v. In other words, the eigenspace e of lambda t is exactly the set of all eigenvectors of t corresponding to lambda along with the zero vector. Recall that by definition, 0 is not an eigenvector of t. Because the null space of every operator on v is a subspace of v, we can conclude that the eigenspace e of lambda t is a subspace of v. It's quite clear from the definitions that a number lambda is an eigenvalue of t if and only if the eigenspace e of lambda t is not the zero subspace. Let's look at an example. Suppose that the matrix of an operator t on v with respect to a basis v1, v2, v3 is the matrix shown here. Note that this is a diagonal matrix. It's easy to verify that the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue 8 is the span of the first basis vector v1, and that the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue 5 is the span of the second and third basis vectors. You should pause the video for a minute and verify these claims. To make sure that you understand these concepts, you should also be sure to verify the following statement. If lambda is an eigenvalue of an operator t, then t restricted to the eigenspace e of lambda t is just the operator of multiplication by lambda. Now we come to an important result. This result states that the sum of distinct eigenspaces is actually a direct sum. Furthermore, the dimensions of these eigenspaces add up to less than or equal to the dimension of the space that we're operating on. Let's sketch part of the proof of this theorem, but be sure to look at the details in the book. To get started, suppose v is a finite dimensional vector space and t is an operator on v. Suppose also that lambda 1 up to lambda m are distinct eigenvalues of t. To show that the sum of eigenspaces is a direct sum, suppose we have a sum u1 plus up to plus um equaling 0, where each uj is in the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda j. Thus, u sub j is either an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda sub j, or u sub j is equal to zero. Earlier in these videos, we discussed the result that eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues are linearly independent. That result, along with the equation displayed to the left, implies that each u sub j equals zero. Now this implies that our sum is actually a direct sum, which is what we wanted to prove. The statement about the sum of the dimensions of the eigenspaces now follows easily. Again, see the details in the book. An operator t on v is called diagonalizable 
if the operator has a diagonal matrix with respect to some basis. Let's look at an example. To find t to be the operator on R2 given by the equation shown here. t applied to the vector 1, 0 gives us the vector 41, 20. Thus, the first column of the matrix of t with respect to the standard basis of R2 is as shown here, 41 and minus 20. If we apply t to the second basis vector, we get t of 0, 1 is 7, 74, and that gives us the second column of the matrix shown here. Obviously, the matrix of t with respect to the standard basis of R2 is not a diagonal matrix. However, this operator t is diagonalizable because the matrix of t with respect to the basis 1, 4 and then 7, 5 is the matrix shown here, as you should verify. In other words, you should verify that t applied to the vector 1, 4 gives us 69 times the vector 1, 4 and t applied to the vector 7, 5 gives us 46 times the vector 7, 5. This example illustrates why we should not always use the standard basis. In this particular example, choosing a different basis gave us a much simpler matrix, in fact, a diagonal matrix. This theme of choosing a basis that gives a simple matrix will reappear often in these videos. Now we come to an important theorem that will give us multiple conditions for an operator to be diagonalizable. The setting is that we have a finite dimensional vector space V and an operator T on V. Let lambda 1 up to lambda m denote the distinct eigenvalues of T. Then the following are equivalent. First, T is diagonalizable. This is equivalent to our second condition, which is that V has a basis consisting of eigenvectors of T. Our third condition is that there exists one-dimensional subspaces, u1 up to un of v, each invariant under t, such that v is the direct sum of these one-dimensional subspaces. Our next equivalent condition is that v is the direct sum of the eigenspaces corresponding to the distinct eigenvalues of t. And our final condition is that the sum of the eigenspaces adds up to the right thing, in other words, adds up to the dimension of v. In summary, each of the last four conditions shown here is equivalent to t being diagonalizable. Be sure to read the proof of this theorem in the book. Unfortunately, not every operator is diagonalizable. That's no surprise if we work on real vector spaces, because their operators might not have any eigenvectors. However, on a complex vector space, we know there always exists at least one eigenvalue, and hence one eigenvector. However, there may not exist enough eigenvectors for the operator to be diagonalizable. Let's look at an example. To find t to be the operator on C2 shown here, in other words, t of w, z equals z, 0. You should pause the video and verify that 0 is the only eigenvalue of t, and furthermore, the eigenspace of 0 is equal to the vector space shown here. It's the one-dimensional vector space consisting of all vectors of the form w, 0. Because the sum of the dimensions of all the eigenspaces adds up to just 1, this shows, by the previous theorem, that t is not diagonalizable. Linear algebra would be simpler if every operator on a complex finite dimensional vector space were diagonalizable, but sadly that's just not the case and we need to deal with that. Our last result in this video is the following theorem. Suppose t is an operator on v and the number of distinct eigenvalues of t is equal to the dimension of the vector space v. The conclusion is that t is diagonalizable. Let's look at a proof. Let n be the dimension of v, and let lambda 1 up to lambda n be the distinct eigenvalues of t. Our hypothesis is that these eigenvalues are indeed distinct. 
for each j, let v sub j be an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda sub j. We know that eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues form a linearly independent list. Thus, the list v1 up to vn is linearly independent. However, we have a theorem that a linearly independent list of vectors whose length is equal to the dimension of the vector space is actually a basis of the vector space. Thus, v1 up to vn is a basis of the vector space v. With respect to this basis, the matrix of T is the diagonal matrix with lambda 1 up to lambda n along the diagonal. This completes the proof. To show the power of diagonalizability, be sure to look at the exercise in the book at the end of this section on the Fibonacci sequence. This exercise shows how finding a basis with respect to which a certain operator has a diagonal matrix leads to an explicit and interesting formula for the Fibonacci sequence. This slide shows a picture of a statue of Fibonacci, who is also known as Leonardo of Pisa. The dates given for his birth and death are just approximations because we do not know the exact dates. This concludes the video on eigenspaces and diagonal matrices.